want to talk about uh, teaching writing um, because this is perhaps the most difficult skill for students to acquire and probably the most difficult for teachers to teach. It's also one of the few things I know anything about. So um, uh, writing it is. I, I plan to present the key approaches to writing as different options, although it's possible to mix and match uh, to some extent. Now you're going to be familiar with 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 uh, some of this, um, but I hope it raises issues for you and uh, helps you to reflect on what it is you do in your own uh, classroom. Now, <clears throat> now each um, focus assumes a different idea about writing and implies different teaching methods. So the first approach concentrates on the products of writing by examining texts. The second focuses on the writer and the processes used to create texts. And the third approach emphasizes the role that readers play in writing, showing how writers think about an audience uh, in creating texts. Now, this is all very broad, but I think it's a useful way of um, discussing and evaluating some of the research and how it feeds into uh, classrooms. First of all, then, um, we have text um, oriented approaches. These see writing as an outcome, the words on a page or on a screen. So this is writing as a noun rather than as a verb. And there are two broad approaches to looking at text because we can either see them as objects or as discourse. Now, seeing text as objects means understanding writing as the application of rules. So writing is a thing independent of any writers, readers, or contexts. And learning to write, or learning to become a good writer, is largely a matter of knowing grammar. So this is what we tend to think of as a product approach. This view sees writing as the arrangement of words, clauses, or sentences. And students can be taught to say exactly what they mean by putting these together effectively. In the writing classroom, teachers emphasize language structures, often in these four stages. First of all, there's some kind of familiarization where students uh, look at a text to understand its grammar and vocabulary. Then there's controlled writing where they manipulate fixed patterns, perhaps uh, using um, uh, substitution tables, um, gap filling. And then there's guided writing where they imitate model texts, completing texts, writing parallel texts. And then finally, learners get to use the patterns that they've uh, developed to write an essay, a letter or whatever. Now, this has been a major classroom approach for many years, but it draws on the rather old fashioned and discredited idea that meaning is contained in the message, that we transfer ideas from one mind to another using language. Now, this lies, this idea lies behind uh, the conduit metaphor of language. Basically, this says that, um, so the lady with the dark hair has an idea, she puts it into words in the box, sends it through the conduit, which here is, is writing. The lady with the fair hair uh, reads the words and has exactly the same idea um, as the lady with the dark hair. So meanings correspond with words and writing is transparent in reflecting meaning rather than constructing them. So meanings can be written down and understood by anyone with the right encoding and decoding skills. A text says everything that needs to be said. There are no conflicts of interest, no reader positions, no different understandings. We all see things in the same way and, and life is wonderful. But this doesn't make sense, of course, because <clears throat> accuracy is just one feature of good writing. And on its own, it doesn't, it doesn't make communication. And this is how lawyers make their money. They, they dispute and pick over the most explicitly written contracts and documents. So our goal as writing teachers can never be just training students in accuracy because all texts include 
what writers assume their readers will know and how they're going to use the text. The writer's problem then is not to make everything explicit, but to make, to make it explicit for um, particular readers, balancing what needs to be said against what can be assumed. So this model then um, sees text as sort of independent of any real life users and adopting it as a teaching approach can mislead students into thinking that they just need to write accurately to be effective. Now, the second text approach to, is to see them as, as discourse, the way that we use language to communicate to achieve purposes in particular situations. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So here the writer is seen as having certain goals and intentions and that the ways we write are resources to accomplish these goals. So instead of forms being independent of context, a discourse approach sees them as located in social actions. Teachers try to see the ways that texts actually work as communication by linking language forms to uh, the purposes for which they're being used and the context in which they're used. So a key idea here, of course, is out of genre, um, a term for, for grouping text together. We know immediately, for example, if a text is a recipe, a joke, a, a, a blog post or, or a love letter, and we can respond to it and perhaps write a similar one if we need to. We all have a a repertoire of these uh, responses that we can call up in, in familiar situations, and we learn new ones as we need them. So genre reminds us that we, when we write, we follow conventions for organising messages because we want our reader to recognise our purpose. So this is rather like the introduction body conclusion um, pattern that we learn to structure our essays uh, like it's back at school all those years ago, um, or the problem solution pattern, which organizes narratives. So here the text usually opens with a contextualizing move, which introduces the players and the situation. Then a problem is introduced for the participants. This is followed by their response to the problem. And then finally, there's an evaluation of the response. So was it successful? So genre approaches, <clears throat> describe the stages which help writers to set out uh, their thoughts in ways that readers can easily follow. All genres have a social purpose and the, um, the goal, main goal of a narrative, of course, is to entertain through, through storytelling. And this is achieved through fairly conventional steps. So this is why Jim Martin calls genre a staged goal-oriented activity. Um, we can't achieve our goal all at once in one go. So we work towards it in stages. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of this from, uh, from classrooms. Um, first of all, um, the explanation. Now an explanation describes a process like um, the water cycle or how something works, a light bulb. <clears throat> This is an example from a primary school um, L1 student about um, uh, hibernation. And um, it's structured as uh, a general straight statement introducing the topic, and then a series of logical steps explaining how or why it occurs. They're usually written um, with uh, generalized non-human participants in the timeless present, a lot of temporal sequence connectors, next, then, after that, causal connectives, because, therefore, and a lot of action verbs, things, things happen. Instructions, on the other hand, are written to describe how something should be done. So they usually consist of uh, a statement about what's to be achieved, so how to make banana muffins, then there's a list of materials and equipment needed to achieve the goal, a series of sequence steps towards the goal, and um, diagrams, illustrations, and so on. Um, I, I should warn you not to make notes of this, um, of this recipe. It, it's not an authentic text. I made it up, and I don't know anything about cooking. So 
you'll get a stomach ache if you eat this. Um, but they are, they do look like this, and they're written generally in chronological order, very direct, simple, present, or imperative. Um, they focus on, on general human groups rather than individuals, short, simple sentences, a lot of signposting words for uh, to indicate the sequence. And again, um, action verbs, things happen. So genres encourages, uh, encourage us to look for patterns to see how meanings are created through um, conventional structures. But what does this look like in the classroom? Well, for one thing, it means attending to grammar. But this is not the um, traditional grammar of the writing as object approach. Here, grammar is a resource for producing text. And a knowledge of grammar then shifts writing from what is implicit and hidden to something that is conscious and explicit so that students can use the grammar to write effectively. Now in class, this often involves getting students to notice, reflect on, and then use writing conventions to help them produce well-formed and appropriate texts. And one approach widely used in Australia is the teaching learning cycle. And you may have seen this um, before. And essentially, the cycle helps us to plan classroom activities by showing genre learning as a series of linked stages, which support learners towards understanding text. Now, the key stages then are, first of all, understanding the uh, purpose of the genre and the settings where it's used. So how does it fit into workplace, social, academic situations? Who writes it? With whom? Who for? Um, why? What's the relationship between the writer and the reader? Is it uh, uh, formal or informal? Is it, um, uh, are there status or power differences and so on? So we look to see, um, we look at a text to see what writers are trying to do in a particular context. The second stage involves modeling the genre, analyzing it to reveal its stages and its key features. So what are the main tenses, uh, themes, what kind of vocabulary does it use and so on. And so here students might get, uh, might be asked to uh, sequence or label text stages or, or reorganize scrambled paragraphs. A third stage, involves the joint construction of the genre through guided teacher supported practice. So maybe students write a, a parallel text or work in small groups on, a, um, on, a, on a, a structured piece of writing. Fourth is independent writing where students work alone, monitored by the teacher. And then finally, the teacher relates what's been um, learned to other genres and contexts. So comparing with other genres that they've already learned or um, seeing how it's linked to uh, other texts in a given context. So each stage has a different purpose and draws on different um, uh, classroom activities. The thing is that students can enter the cycle at any stage, depending on what they already know about the genre, and genres can be recycled at more advanced levels of expression. The cycle also provides students with scaffolded learning, so supporting them through what Zygotsky calls on the right there, the zone of proximal development. So the gap between students' current and potential um, uh, performance. So as we move around the circle, direct teacher instruction is reduced and students gradually get more confidence to learn the genre um, on their own. So their autonomy um, increases as they gain greater control over the genre. Now, genre teaching has been criticized for stifling creativity, imposing models on students. And obviously there are risks here as teachers might teach uh, genres as a kind of recipe so that students get the idea that they just need to, to pour their own content into ready-made molds. 
But I don't think there's any reason why genres, why providing students with an understanding of discourse should be any more prescriptive than um, say providing them with a description of the clause or, or steps in a writing uh, process. The key point is that genres do constrain us. Uh, once we accept that our goals are best served by writing, say, a, a blog post or a lab report, then we're going to write within expected patterns. The genre doesn't dictate what we write um, or determine how we write it. It enables choices to be made because meaning comes from choosing some choices rather than others. It's that, it's that um, difference that readers can observe that creates the meaning. So genre theorists suggest that uh, a teacher who understands how texts are typically structured, understood and used, is in a better position to uh, intervene successfully in the writing development of his or her students. Now, the second broad approach uh, focuses on the writer rather than on the text. So interest here is on what good writers do um, when they write so that we can teach these methods to uh, second language students. So writing is seen as a, a process through which we discover and, and reformulate our ideas as we write. So this is more of a problem solving activity than an act of communication. How people approach writing um, a writing task as, as a, and solve it as a problem. So to explain how writers solve this problem, process theorists draw on the tools of cognitive psychology um, and artificial intelligence. So in this model, there's a, um, there's a memory, a central processing unit, problem solving programs and flowcharts. Now this flowchart of the of the process is, is probably well known to, to everybody here. It shows that writers don't create text by thinking, writing, editing, but they keep jumping between these different stages. So the, the, the diagram suggests and process tells us that um, writers have goals and that they plan extensively often through internet searches, note taking and so on. That writing is constantly revised, often in our heads before any text has been produced. That planning, drafting and revising and editing um, are recursive, they happen again and again, and they're potentially simultaneous. And plans and texts are constantly evaluated by the writer in a kind of feedback loop, uh, plan, write, plan, write. So the model, advises teachers to assist writers um, by encouraging um, pre-writing tasks like brainstorming and outlining to generate ideas, to write several drafts, uh, improving each one as they go along, by giving uh, feedback on drafts and encouraging peer response to writing, by delaying surface corrections, so uh, changing the organization or the grammar um, uh, at, at only at the final editing, and then publishing the work, um, sharing it with others as a poster, a class paper, a website or whatever. Now, this has been the dominant uh, model in many countries for 50 years, um, particularly strong in, in the US. But students, I think, need language support, not just writing support to overcome their problems. Getting students to reflect on how they write, I don't think is going to improve what they write. So the influence of cognitive, cognitive psychology rather than applied linguistics means that teachers are concerned with what students think about when they write rather than the language that they need to do it. And this creates four main uh, problems for teaching writing. First of all, by overemphasizing psychological factors, it neglects the importance of how context influences writing. So process focuses on the writer as an isolated individual, uh, struggling to express personal meanings. So it tends to represent writing as a decontextualized skill. 
there's little understanding of the ways that um, language is used in particular domains or what it means to communicate with others in writing. But in fact, we very rarely just write. Um, we always write for a purpose in a particular context. And this involves variation in the ways that we use language and the ways that we write, not universal rules. So in other words, process models don't really give us any help in understanding language, nor do they allow us to confidently advise students on their writing. The second problem is that a discovery-based approach like this doesn't make the language students need explicit. They're taught the structures um, they're not taught the structures of target text types, but are expected to discover appropriate forms in the process of writing itself or in the teacher's comments in, in, in track changes uh, on their drafts. Now, this might be fine uh, for well-educated um, students or L1 students, but second language writers often find themselves in an invisible curriculum. And Amy Delpit puts this very well when she says, adherence to process approaches to writing create situations in which students ultimately find themselves held accountable for knowing a set of rules about which no one has ever directly informed them. Teachers do students no service to suggest, even implicitly, that product is not important. They're gonna be judged on their product regardless of the process used to achieve it. And that product, based as it is on the specific codes of a particular culture, is more readily produced when the directives to, um, of how to produce it are made explicit. A third problem with this approach is that it, that it assumes that making the processes of expert writers explicit will make novices better writers. But not all writing is the same. Not, it doesn't always depend on an ability to use universal, context-independent revision and editing practices. So exam writing, for example, doesn't involve multi-drafting -draft, and revision. And a lot of academic and professional writing is collaborative and time-constrained. So different writing uh, kinds of writing involve uh, different kinds of process. And finally, I think um, process models disempower teachers. So this is a model of learning based on personal freedom, self-expression and learner responsibility, all of which might be crushed by too much teacher intervention. And this reduces the teacher to well-meaning bystanders. We just assign a task and give feedback later. And then because language is and organization tend to be added on to the end of the process as editing, rather than forming a central um, resource for constructing meanings, then students are given no way of seeing how texts are written for particular purposes and audiences. Um, this is Chris Tribble, um, taking a selfie on a very bad day by looking at it, but um, he says, while a process approach will certainly make it possible for apprentice writers to become more effective at generating texts, this may be to little avail if they're not aware of what their readers expect to find in those texts. Okay, now the writer-oriented research I've been talking about sees context as the site of writing, where the writer is, what she's thinking of, and so on. A final approach expands the idea of context beyond the local situ writing situation to the reader's context, how writers think their text will be understood and what they do to address the reader. So um, writers are encouraged to think about these kinds of questions. Who are you writing for? What's your relationship? Is it formal or informal, uh, friendly or a stranger? What does she already know? an expert or a beginner? Um, what does uh, he or she believe? Will she understand your text? Will she agree with the ideas in it? So essentially, when we write, we choose our words to connect with others and present our ideas in ways that make most sense to them. We try and, and draw readers in to influence them, persuade them, inform them, entertain them in using a text 
that sees the world in the same way as them. And we do this using the words, the structures, and the kinds of argument that they're going to expect and understand. So a reader-oriented view emphasizes the interaction between writers and readers. The process of writing here involves creating a text that the writer assumes the reader will recognize and expect. And the process of reading involves drawing on assumptions about what the writer is trying to do. Um, you know, we've known this for years. This is called coherence in, in linguistics. Now it's the unfamiliarity of these expectations, um, which is one reason why writing in English is so difficult for speakers of other languages because what's seen as logical, engaging, relevant, coherent, all vary across different cultures. Culture isn't the only explanation, of course, but it's clear there are different ways of organizing ideas and structuring arguments in different languages. So research shows, for example, that compared with many languages, academic texts in English at a register level um, tend to be more explicit about their structure and purposes, they employ more and more recent citations, they use fewer rhetorical questions than students like, they're less tolerant of digressions, uh, they're more cautious in making claims, they have stricter conventions for uh, subsections and headings, and they use more sent sentence connectors, therefore, however, um, on the other hand, and so on. Now, because of this, EAP teachers spend a lot of time focusing on the ways which uh, help students to do this, teaching things like nominalization, impersonalization, sentence connectives, hedging, metadiscourse, and so on. Now, Michael Klein suggests that we can trace these features to the fact that English makes the writer responsible for clarity. So in some traditions of writing, um, I think German, Korean, Finnish, Chinese, it's the writer who, it's the reader who makes a text clear. The writer complements the reader by not spelling everything out. But in English, the writer has to set things out uh, clearly so it can be easily understood. And I know that my Hong Kong students got uh, uh, sick of what they saw as a repetition. Um, say what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you've said. It seems too much. But considering readers then largely means um, looking at how writing is used by social groups. And the idea of discourse community is important here as a way of joining text writers and readers together. Now, discourse community is a fuzzy idea, um, but it helps to show us something of how writing is works in different uh, disciplines and different workplaces. It tells us, for example, that needs analysis is important and uh, because different disciplines value different kinds of argument and set different writing tasks. So in the humanities and social sciences, for example, analysing and synthesising from multiple sources is an important skill, whereas in the sciences and engineering uh, and technology, activity-based skills like um, describing procedures, defining objects and planning solutions are needed. Um, perhaps at the most obvious uh, level of community difference is Lexis. This um, slide shows the most common content words taken from uh, chapters in five first year university linguistics books and five from uh, biology. And um, we can see that the disciplines have completely ways, different ways of talking about the world and students need to learn completely different vocabularies. Less obviously, um, a study of an academic corpus of four million words that Polly Say and I did a few years ago um, showed that the so-called universal items, semi-technical items in Coxhead's academic word list actually have widely different frequencies and preferred meanings in different fields. So consist means stay the same in the social sciences and composed of in the sciences. Volume means book in applied linguistics and 
complexity in biology. And abstract means removing engineering and theoretical and social sciences. So they're polysemous words. And words which seem to be the same have different meanings across fields. Words can also be uh, misleading um, in, in technical context. Althea Haar and I looked at a large corpus of uh, words from economics and finance and identified over 830 words which had a meaning specific to economic and finance, although many of them also had a general meaning at all, like um, asset, risk, interest and income. But they had a far more specific word uh, meaning in the um, discipline. We also know that different uh, fields make use of different genres. So that in their large scale corpus study of 30 disciplines in UK universities, Nessie and Gardner found 13 different genre families, ranging from design specifications, research reports, explanations, um, through to um, uh, critiques, which differ considerably in their social purpose, their genre structure, and the networks that they form with other genres. Even in closely related fields, um, students are given very, very different assignments. So Jimenez found that nursing and midwifery students write very different uh, assignments. So we can uh, see that there was very little overlap there. Now, um, in teaching, a reader-oriented uh, approach suggests using rhetorical consciousness raising um, means to um, help students to understand the text that they have to deal with and write. And basically the idea is to encourage students to think about uh, their own writing and to help, help them to see how language is actually used by analysing text. Now there are various ways of doing this. Um, uh, getting students to look at corpora is, is uh, uh, increasingly important. Um, and, um, but I just want to mention two here, portfolios and reader analysis, just to wrap up. Um, so Anne Johns you, uh, um, advises using mixed genre portfolios. So these are where students are asked to write um, a range of different genres during a course, say an argument essay, research-based assignment, the summary, collect them together for assessment in a folder at the end of the course, together with a commentary on each one. So, um, and then at the uh, end of the course, um, uh, students can reflect on the differences. Uh, this is an example um, actually taken from um, uh, a secondary school in Singapore that Han Johns was involved with. And um, so the commentary can encourage students to ask questions like, why did you organize the essay in this way? Or what parts of it do you like best? What difficulties did you um, have in writing it? What did you learn from it? So the portfolio doesn't just give us as teachers uh, a, a more accurate picture of, of students writing and what they can do, but it also has a consciousness raising function. It, getting students to think about the similarities and the differences between genres and how language can be used to achieve these rhetorical goals. Finally, we can encourage students to think about their readers, um, interviewing proficient users of a genre, like their, their content tutors, for example, about their own writing. Or perhaps more realistically in many contexts, teachers can encourage their students to think about who their readers are and what they need from a text. So this simple checklist can help sensitize students to the importance of thinking about shared knowledge. So this is an example um, of a response to a letter of complaint, but it can be adapted for any, any kind of uh, text. Okay, that's brought me to the end. Um, I've tried to cover the major frameworks that are used to look at writing and at the same time to argue that writing isn't just words on a page or on a screen, um, nor is it the activity of isolated individuals. It's always a social practice influenced by cultural and 
institutional context. Now, what this means for teachers is that we need, as far as possible, I think, to become researchers of the text our students will um, need and the context in which they're likely to need them. And then through our classroom activities, to make these features to these, of these texts as explicit as we possibly can. Thanks very much for your attention.